Chapter 10 of Armageddon 2419 A.D. by Philip Francis Nolan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 10 The Walls of Hell. The traitors were, it seemed, a degenerate gang of Americans located a few miles north of New York on the wooded banks of the Hudson, the Sinsings. They had exchanged scraps of information to the Hans in return for several old repeller ray machines and the privilege of tuning in on the Han electronic power broadcast for their operation, provided their ships agreed to subject themselves to the orders of the Han traffic office while aloft. The rest wanted to ultraphone their news at once, since there was always danger that we might never get back to the gang with it. I objected, however. The Sinsings would be likely to pick up our message. Even if we use the directional projector, they might have scouts out to the west and south in the big inner-city stretches of country. They would flee to New York and escape the punishment they merited. It seemed to be vitally important that they should not, for the sake of example to other weak groups among the American gangs, as well as to prevent a crisis in which they might clear more vital information to the enemy. Out to the sea again, I ordered Gibbons. They'll be less likely to look for us in that direction. Easy, boss, easy, he replied. Wait until we get up a mile or two more. They must have discovered evidences of our raid by now, and their disray wall may go into operation at any moment. Even as he spoke, the ship lurched downward into one side. There it is, he shouted. Hang on, everybody. We're going to nose straight up. And he flipped the rocket motor control wide open. Looking through one of the rear ports, I could see a nebulous, luminous ring and on all sides of the atmosphere took on a faint iridescence. We were almost over the destructive range of the disintegrator ray wall, a hollow cylinder of annihilation shooting upward from a solid ring of generators surrounding the city. It was the main defense system of the Hans, which had never been used except in periodic tests. They may or may not have suspected that an American rocket ship was within the cylinder, Probably they had turned on their generators more as a precaution to prevent any reaching a position above the city. But even at our present great height, we were in great danger. It was a question how much we might have been harmed by the rays themselves, for their effective range was not much more than seven or eight miles. The greater danger lay in the terrific downward rush of air within the cylinder to replace that which was being burned into nothingness by the continual play of the disintegrators. The air fell into the cylinder with the force of a gale, it would be rushing toward the wall from the outside with terrific force also, but naturally the effect was intensified on the interior. Our ship vibrated and trembled. We had only one chance of escape, to fight our way well above the current. To drift down with it meant ultimately and inevitably to be sucked into the destruction wall at some lower level. But very gradually and jerkily our upward movement, as shown on the indicators, began to increase and after an hour of desperate struggle we were free of the maelstrom and into the rarefied upper levels. The terror beneath us was now invisible through several layers of cloud formations. Gibbons brought the ship back to an even keel and drove her eastward into one of the most brilliantly gorgeous sunrises I have ever seen. We described a great circle to the south and west in a long, easy dive, for he had cut out his rocket motors to save them as much as possible. We had drawn terrifically on their fuel reserves in our battle with the elements. For the moment, the atmosphere below cleared, and we could see the Jersey coast far beneath like a great map. We're not through yet, remarked Gibbon suddenly, pointing at his periscope and adjusting it to telescopic focus. A Han ship, and a drop ship at that, and he's seen us. If he whips that beam of his on us, we're done. I gazed fascinated at the viewplate. What I saw was a cigar-shaped ship not dissimilar to our own in design, and from the proportional size of its ports of about the same size as our swoopers. We learned later that they carried crews, for the most part, of not more than three or four men. They had streamlined hulls and tails that embodied universal-jointed double fishtail rudders. In operation, they rose to great heights on their powerful repeller rays, then gathered speed either by a straight nose dive or an inclined dive in which they sometimes used the repeller ray slanted at a sharp angle. He was already above us, though several miles to the north. He could, of course, try to get on our tail and spear us with his beam as he dropped at us from a great height. Suddenly his beam blazed forth in a blinding flash, whipping downward slowly to our right. 
he went through a peculiar corkscrew-like evolution, evidently maneuvering to bring his beam to bear on us with a spiral motion. Gibbons instantly sent our ship into a series of evolutions that must have looked like those of a frightened hen. Alternately, he used the forward and the reverse rocket blasts, and in varying degree, we fluttered, we shot suddenly to right and left, and dropped like a plummet in uncertain movement. But all the time the Han scout dropped toward us, determinedly whipping the air around us with his beam. Once it sliced across beneath us, not more than a hundred feet, and we dropped with a jar into the pocket formed by the destruction of the air. He had dropped within a mile of us, and was coming with the speed of a projectile when the end came. Gibbons always swore it was sheer luck. Maybe it was, but I like pilots who are lucky that way. In the midst of a dizzy, fluttering maneuver of our own, with the Han ship enlarging to our gaze with terrifying rapidity, and its beam slowly slicing toward us in what looked like certain destruction within the second, I saw Gibbons' fingers flick at the lever of his rocket gun, and a split second later the Han ship flew apart like a clay pigeon. We staggered and fluttered crazily for several moments while Gibbon struggled to bring our ship into balance, and a section of about four feet square at the side of the ship near the stern slowly crumbled like rusted metal. His beam actually had touched us, but our explosive rocket had got him a thousandth of a second sooner. Part of our rudder had been annihilated and our motor damaged, but we were able to swoop gently back across Jersey, fortunately crossing the ship lanes without sighting any more Han craft and finally settling to rest in the little glade beneath the trees near Hart's camp. End of chapter 10